I'm going to start my talk by first uh, speaking about uh, cumulants and how they, in my opinion, they relate to renormalization, since this is a renormalization conference. And then uh, I'm going to go a little bit into Magnus expansion, and at the very end, I'm going to present our results. So let's get started. Um, so what's a cumulant? Uh, usually the most classical context is that you have uh, a classical random variable, uh, call it x, uh, such that it has exponential moments. Uh, so this means that uh, the series that's defined here by mu z, uh, it has a finite radius of, radius of convergence. Yeah. So it's, it might be very small, but it, it's, it's, uh, it converges around zero. So for example, if you take the derivative in z of this function and evaluate at zero, sorry, uh, you can obtain essentially all the moments of the random variable x. Uh, but these are, this is a complicated object since moments are highly nonlinear. Uh, so you would like to get kind of a simple description of your random variable. Uh, and so what you do is that you somehow linearize the moments and take the log of this moment generating function and end up with the, what's called the cumulant. So the log also can be expanded as a power series in z, the same radius of convergence, and the coefficients that you get in front of the z uh, power n, you, you call the cum nth cumulant of your random variable. Uh, yeah. So under some conditions, you can actually be sure that the moments and the cumulants characterize the distribution. Uh, it's, uh, just because uh, there is a one-to-one -one relation between moments and cumulants, and these extra conditions ensure that actually these uh, Laplace transforms characterize the underlying measure. Uh, so two simple examples, which are very well known, are uh, normal random variables. So if you have a center normal, run, uh, normal variable with a variance sigma squared, you can compute its cumulants. They are very simple. It's just uh, the first one is zero, the second one is sigma squared, and all the subsequent cumulants are also zero. And this uniquely characterizes the, uh, the normal distribution. So you see, for example, if you try to compute the moments, you get moments of all even all orders, but here the cumulants you get just one. So it's much simpler. Uh, so for, Poisson, for a Poisson distribution, uh, you also get a similar description. The cumulants are all equal to, to lambda, the parameter of the So moments are kind of a natural object in terms of random variables. It's, a, it's an object that you would naturally look at, whereas cumulants are some sort of not so natural maybe. Uh, but anyways, you can compute them. So there's a very old uh, theorem by Leonov and Shiryev uh, that tells you how to compute recursively the cumulants given the moments. And this, this relation also can be inverted. And the, the inversion that you get, uh, so I cite speed here, for example, uh, for a multivariate version of, uh, of the relation that's written here. Uh, you can compute the nth moment by just multiplying cumulants of uh, the correct orders. And how you coordinate this uh, product is given by the lattice of partitions of the set one to n. Uh, this can also be, you, you get a similar formula when you have um, multiple random variables. So say instead of having just the nth power of x, you have n different random variables. Here on the right, you would get uh, what's called the mixed cumulants. And in this paper, we, together with Kurus, Frederick, and Lorenzo, we explore this type of relations uh, using Hopf algebraic techniques. Uh, as a remark, I should also mention that uh, the cumulants are also related to weak products. So if you take this random variable here on the left and you tailor expand it in powers of z, the polynomials that you get in front are what's usually called the, the weak uh, powers of x. And they have nice properties. For example, they are all centered. So this is kind of a recentering procedure for, the, for your random variable. Uh, yeah, and um, they are also in some way, you can think of them as some counter terms that you're adding. So here there are no di divergences, but, uh, but yeah. So in the next slide, I'm going to show one example. So uh, this is all very classical. Um, so you would like to make it more interesting, right? So one easy way to make it more interesting is adding dynamics. Uh, and what you can do is that you look at, for example, the sign Gordon model. So you take a kernel 
which is usually for this model at least would be log correlated and you build you build a random field x uh, that has k as a correlate uh, as a correlation function uh, and you tilt the measure so you you make a uh, so you define a new measure on paths by uh, weighting your uh, original measure that's uh, kind of giving you this random field by this exponential weight. So this is sort of a Gibbs measure on, on path phase. And you need to insert this uh, one over Z, which is the partition function just to make this a probability measure. Uh, right, so you would like to do this. Uh, this, for example, um, uh, it's a good description of a log gas in, in, in RD. So depending on your choice of kernel, you can describe some models by doing transformation of this sort. Uh, the one problem here is that since your kernel is very regular at the diagonal, this, uh, this uh, random field X will actually be a distribution. So this integral that's inside the exponential doesn't make sense. And there you, you can see that you sort of have to renormalize so to make, to make this definition precise. So what you can do is that you regularize your kernel by introducing some parameter, some convolution parameter, T, which uh, you would like to remove in the end. So this is just to allow for computations to be made precise. And then you would like to take this uh, regularization uh, out by taking some limit. For example, here, as I've written it, you would take T to infinity. So I've not made explicit the regularization that I'm thinking here, but anyway. And you build a random field using the new, this new kernel and you can obtain a martingale. So a martingale is a dynamic object. So you have this T dependence here and it has some special properties and you kind of reweight uh, your exponential weight by this exponential factor here inside. So this becomes, you can show that this becomes a martingale. Um, and you can show then that the moment generating function of this MT for fixed T gives you this expression and this is actually the partition function of uh, of of uh, so interacting particles in RD which are have charges plus and minus one. And the, this beta square here would be the inverse temperature, and the, the alpha is sort of a coupling constant. Uh, right. Uh, the problem here is that if beta is too big, when you take the limit, it goes to infinity. You uh, this doesn't converge because essentially you would be constructing this measure which doesn't exist. So. Uh, you need to reweight again your measure by using actually cumulants. And this is sort of uh, the same formula that I showed you above. Right? So this is some sort of uh, weak renormalization. Um, right, and so this also motivates why, why would you need or would want to compute cumulants? Right? Because you want to know sort of what you have to put here. Okay, and, and you can show that for beta small enough, this, uh, this partition function here actually has a limit as t goes to infinity, so you can actually remove the regularization and you can construct the p tilde measure on the left by just taking the limit t goes to infinity of this reweighted re uh, Gibbs measure. So you, you cannot take, you would like to take, but you have to insert some counter terms here in the, in the weight to make this converge. Okay, so these are some sort of one of the possible relations from uh, between cumulants and, and renormalization. Um, and so how, you, how do you compute this? Excuse me, yes. do you mind if we ask questions? Yes, sure. Uh, do you have a systematic way of uh, uh, picking uh, out these uh, counter terms? Um, that you said the uh, cumulants um, are used to introduce some kind of counter terms, if I understand. Right, so okay, have you got so, a systematic way of choosing them? Uh, yeah, so you can, in the case where you have a martingale, so you have an exponential weight of this form, you can recursively compute them, and this is what's, uh, what's on the next slide. Okay, thank so you. So maybe this is a very special case, but nonetheless, you have some structure, yes. So what you need to introduce is uh, for actually semi martingale, so Kind of semi martingales are the most general class of stochastic process where you can do stochastic integration without problems. You introduce a product between them, two, two, two semi martingales, by taking this conditional expectation here of the, of the continuous part. Uh, don't worry if you, know what, you don't know what that means, but uh, somehow you can, 
using this diamond product, you can do a recursive computation of your of the these counter terms or cumulants that I was talking about before. So uh, one nice or interesting feature of this product is that it is commutative, right? So because this bracket is commutative here at the moment, everything commutes, but it's non-associative. So I have no idea if this product satisfies some type of uh, relation. So I don't know if it's pre or something, I don't think so, but anyway, it gives you some non-associativity comes into the picture. And uh, this theorem, so the recursive computation of the cumulants uh, appear in the previous uh, paper by Lacan, uh, Roth, and Vargas. This is how they actually prove the conversions of the measure because you need kind of very precise control on the size of these terms and the, this recursion that's written here allows you to compute them and analyze them. Uh, and it had appeared before in a work by Gadar and Radojic. And then it was generalized by Fritz, Gadar and Radojic. Uh, so this is not the most general version that is in this last paper. But anyways, I guess it's good enough for, for the presentation. Uh, and I should mention that in this first paper, it actually appeared um, in, a, in a stochastic finance model where AT here, so the thing you would like to compute the, the cumulant function above is maybe some payoff at the final time of, of some stock, something like that. So AT in principle also follows that dynamic, right? So you can, um, you can compute these KTs recursively by using this formula here, which involves the diamond product. And since it's non-associative, you can actually reorganize this by using uh, binary trees. So it gives you sort of a, tree a binary tree expansion uh, of your counter terms, which is, a, again, you use some sort of graded structure here. So you can go level by level computing uh, the KTs using this, this diamond. Uh, so at least in this case, where, when the Martingale has this very simple form, you can give, again, a very simple proof of this fact which just uses its formula. So you, you define MT to be this. So you know it's a martingale. And lambda T is all the cumulants that, that are not the first one, which is, would be MT. So almost by definition, you can show that uh, this exponential here defines a martingale. So its stochastic logarithm is also a martingale, which is what I've written here. So in particular, this means that when you take the increment and take conditional expectation, it should be zero. If you replace the, the, the definition of KT into this, um, into this formula and expand in powers of set, compares both sides and you get the recursion. So the proof is not too hard and it's just a very clever application of its formula. Uh, right. So at least in, the very, in this very simple case, you get something like this. Now you would like to uh, understand a little bit more, for example, possible generalizations of this fact. And uh, what you can do is, uh, as I was speaking before, you're considering some dynamics. And when you say dynamics, at least to me, I immediately think about Taylor expansions and uh, iterated integrals as uh, was uh, presented nice in his talk just before me. And uh, when you are speaking about iterated integrals, I immediately think, think of signatures. So this slide is just to fix notations. Uh, I'm going to define a signature in the next slide, but it's usually, it's uh, nothing more than the collection of iterated integrals of some function. Uh, and so just to fix ideas, I'm going to work with uh, non-commutative power series, which I, were, uh, I like to write as word series. So for me, uh, uh, a word series is just a formal sum of numbers. So this SW uh, here is um, just a real number in front of a word in the alphabet one to D, that's the D here. Uh, so you could write it like this, or you could actually organize the sum by taking the, the sum over words of a fixed length. So the SN is the, the collection of the coefficients uh, in front of words of length exactly, exactly N. So there's a standard way of multiplying this series. So RS is just the Cauchy product. Uh, 
which you can define like this. And if you look really at the components that you get in front of words, uh, it's, uh, it can be written like this. So some of you might recognize here some type of co-product, which I'm, I'm not introduced, but it's the standard deconcatenation co-product on words. So actually this uh, RS product, this Cauchy product, uh, means that uh, the, the formal power series are actually the convolution algebra of some Hopf algebra. You, using this product, you can define exponential logarithm maps by the usual power series. And it turns out that it gives bijections between a certain, certain groups and certain Lie algebras uh, of power series. So the, the one that would play the role of um, the Hopf algebra of trees, that was uh, in, in Agent's presentation, uh, in this context would be the shuffle algebra. So uh, the series uh, that have coefficients that are related to each other by this shuffle relation here. So when you multiply two of the coefficients in the series, you can rewrite this as a uh, sum of uh, other of the same coefficients uh, dictated by this shuffle. And this is sort of uh, similar to what we saw in Yosha's talk when he spoke about quasi-shuffle and iterated sums. And uh, you let uh, G to, to be the, um, the power series that have zero coefficients when you take the shuffles. So if you take the specific linear combination of the coefficients in the power series, there should be zero. So you have two spaces, the big G, which are the ones that satisfy the shuffle relation and the small frac G, which are the ones that vanish on shuffles. And it turns out that the exponential gives you a bijection between these two spaces. So this is what you would call uh, the bijection between the group of characters and infinitesimal characters. So the, the S, uh, the little g would be the infinitesimal characters. Uh, but it turns out that there's, there's a bigger group, which we will need in the sequel, which is denoted here by T1. And math, math frac T is the associated Lie algebra, or at least formally algebra, because I've not, uh, spoken about uh, any topology here. So these are the series that start with a one. So this is T1 and the, the corresponding Lie algebra are the series that start with a zero. The coefficients, the, the other coefficients can be whatever they want, but uh, the constant term has to be either zero or one. Um, right, and it turns out that the exponential and the logarithm still gives you a bijection between these two spaces. And uh, both uh, Lie type uh, spaces become Lie algebras when you take just the usual commutator bracket between the series given by this product here. Uh, right, so why am I introducing all this? It's because I want to talk about the, what's the signature. So the signature is actually a very specific uh, word series or tensor series that it's built out of a path uh, where the coefficients are given by iterated integrals of this path. So the, the superscript here means really you take the W1 component. So W is a word in symbols one to D, which are indicating the dimensions of the, the space where X lives in. And you take uh, an iterated integral uh, coordinated by the, the words, the letters that you see in your word. Okay, uh, so what is it good for? And I think this comes uh, back to Alessandra's question maybe on Tuesday uh, in Yosha's talk. So why would you want to look at this character, at this specific character? So one reason is that it solves this sort of universal ODE. So it solves a linear ODE in this power series, non-commutative power series space. And by universal, what I mean is that if you give me any other controlled uh, equation driven by this X that has this form, I can actually give you a local description of the solution by composing the vector fields with themselves. This is the FW part here and sort of a monomial that's made up of iterated integrals of your driving path. So somehow if you want a local description of the solution of this equation, you can sort of split the, the infinitesimal part, which is the given by the vector fields and, and the group part which is given by this iterated integral. So you can think of this as a generalized uh, Taylor expansion. And depending on the regularity of your path, if you take N high enough, enough this actually gives you a notion of solution uh, for, you know, for more irregular paths. So if they're not absolutely continuous. 
Uh, they also satisfy, this collection also satisfies chance relation, which is uh, shown here. Um, and this is just a restatement of the flow property of the audio on the left. And uh, if you take it like this, uh, re in 54 show that they, the components actually show, uh, satisfy the shuffle relation. So they are a character over the shuffle algebra. Nicola, may I ask a question? Yes. Regarding this Chen Fee series uh, uh, remark. So I could also separate this and say that this concatenation of vector fields works on, on a word W and the signature word. Uh, uh, acts on the same word. So I could have this, say, tensor product of F with the signature applied to the tensor product word times word, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So actually, uh, Yosha mentioned in his talk that for some specific choices of path, you can compute the signature, which would be an exponential of a product of exponential. But actually, it turns out that this uh, ODE here tells you that it, it is always an exponential. And this is just given by the Magnus expansion. So if you try to compute the logarithm, it might not be easy, but you can also do it by solving an associated uh, ODE, which is uh, the, Magnus, the Hausdorff ODE, sorry. Uh, and it's given, it's, uh, you get a modified vector field, it's not linear anymore. Uh, and the, the vector field that you get in front is actually given by the Bernoulli numbers here. And then, you can say, okay, I want to recursively compute the solution. Then Magnus shows in 54 that if you decompose it sort of in, in tensor levels, uh, you can recursively compute your solution like this. So it, uh, it lives in the freely algebra, for example, generated by the, the X, uh, so in D generators, and you get a very explicit formula. And now we would like to do the same but when uh, our X is actually a stochastic process, so a semi martingale in general. So first we have to define what we mean by a tensor valued semi martingale And uh, what we mean by that is just you take a real value semi martingale and you put it as entries in, in a tensor series. Oh, sorry. So again, a tensor valued semi martingale is just a tensor series, which is each of the components is a real value semi martingale uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to need some notation here. So for example, if I put a C as a sub subscript uh, for my semi-martingale, I'm talking about the continuous martingale part, which is well-defined given some, some conditions that I'm not uh, going to speak about. So. Anyway, you can take, uh, you can take semi-martingales and you can extend them to tensor valued semi-martingales. Uh, you can define a square bracket between them between semi martingales so these are real values, and an angle bracket, which is sort of remo removing the jump part. And we extend this definition to tensor value semi martingales so we have an outer bracket, which is uh, inserting uh, the usual uh, tensor bracket, sorry, the, the usual uh, real value bracket as coefficients, and it's going into the tensor space, so it's giving you a couple of tensors, or, or a tensor product of two series and an inner bracket, which is just multiplying and taking the continuous part. So you multiply this and, and remove the jumps. So this is sort of extending the usual operations that you would do for semi martingales to the tensor setting. And then using a similar trick as I, uh, as I uh, told you before, when I show you the proof of the, uh, so maybe I show you it again. So of this theorem, by identifying an appropriate exponential martingale, uh, in this setting, uh, in the tensor setting, you can, you can show a similar recursion. So what is this exponential martingale? Well, is the signature. So the signature actually acts as an exponential in this sense. Uh, so one small detail that uh, I didn't uh, speak about before is that in the usual case, when you have a regular path, so say uh, a path of uh, so an absolutely continuous path, just doing this integral here is enough because you get the shuffle relation. So if this is an stochastic integral, uh, then really you don't get a shuffle relation. So what you have to do, or one thing you can do to fix this is to take uh, the, this integral in the Marcus sense. So this is what I've indicated with a circle here. So you need to add all of these uh, sort of correction terms to make this integration here 
sort of behave like a usual integral in the sense that you get a chain rule and, and stuff like that. So we introduced this sort of Marcus signature for semi-martingale, so tensor-valued semi-martingale. So this is again a solution of a stochastic equation which is similar to the one that's solved uh, by the classical signature. And you can show again, since this is just a solution of an ODE or for a stochastic uh, ODE, it also has the chain property, because, again, because you get the flow property. But now the added advantage is that you can, since everything here is random, you can actually talk about moments and cumulants. So the, this moment here, mu t that I've defined, it's sort of a generating function for x because since you can always write the signature as some type of exponential, uh, that's morally what you're doing. And you can actually show that under certain conditions, this, this characterizes the law of X in path space. So as a, um, as a tensor value path. And so you would like a similar description for the logarithm. So even if you can, if you have the shuffle relations for the signature, the mu t only lives in t1. So even if you have a very well, well behaved uh, character here by taking this expectation projection, you, you lose this property. So you re really need to work in the bigger group, which is not so nice uh, since you know the, the, the Lie algebra uh, for, for the character group, at least in this context very well. So, but the, this little t here, it's a bit more complicated. And if you define it like this, you also get moment cumulant relations, which are now organized by a different lattice of partitions, which are called all the partitions. And uh, so these, these cumulants are also uniquely defined by the moments. So you can invert this relation and compute the, the cumulants in terms of the moments. So there's a, again a one to one correspondence between moments and cumulants, just as, as in the classical case. Um, so if, if your X is, uh, you have enough integrability, you can actually show that this transformation gives you new semi-martingales. So if you start with a semi-martingale, uh, compute the signature and take a, an expectation, you end up with another tensor valued semi-martingale, which now lives in T1. And if you take the cumulants, since the, you have the exponential logarithm by action, the, the KT, so the cumulants will live will be a semi-martingale in the, in the uh, small Tilly algebra. So this is really a tensor value generalization that was made by, by Fritz uh, Gader and uh, Radojic. So instead of just allowing a real valued semi-martingale, you allow a, a semi-martingale that may contain a free tensor or tensor any, any type of tensor levels that you want. Uh, and so, Having semi-martingales is nice because, we, because it means that you can do ethocalculus, calculus. So you can try to repeat the, the, um, the computations that we did above. So this very simple proof here. Uh, you remember we identified sort of an exponential martingale. So by ethos formula, you can show that some function of it is also a martingale, which is, would be some type of logarithm. And then you get your recursion. Of course, in this case, it's more, much more complicated because of the non-commutativity that's introduced here by looking at this tensor series, but anyways, you, you can try it. And what you get is this uh, rather lengthy expression. So you can show that the signature cumulants are, a, uh, a, a, are the unique solution to this functional equation. So you see you have ka uh, kappa on the left and on the right. And it's given by all the stochastic characteristics of X. So it includes uh, an Ito integral of X with respect to H uh, adjoint action of Kappa. So this would be like a Magnus term. If you remember, this was exactly the term. If you forget about the expectation, this is exactly the same kind of term that you would get from a Magnus expansion. So as we will see later in specific case, we actually recover the Magnus expansion and all that's to the right. So these uh, four terms here are coming from uh, just the stochastic nature of the problem. Uh, so you need to, so probably some people will recognize 
this quadratic variation term, which is uh, with the one half, which is sort of typical when you do ETHO calculus uh, for continuous semi martingale So this is the continuous part uh, here. Uh, this, uh, and this part here comes sort of from computing the second derivative of the exponential map. This is this Q here. Uh, it doesn't matter that much the, the specific form, but I have it under just for completeness. And, uh, and a last term that kind of takes care of the jumps, possible jumps that uh, X might have. Okay, so this is not quite the recursion. You have to extract it from here, but this is the same type of functional equation that was satisfied by the, the, the uh, Martingale cumulants in the, in the kind of commutative term. So in a sense, if you have uh, a Martingale X, say normal X, not whole phase X, and you augment it by adding some extra components. So for example, adding some quadratic variation or, or a matrix or whatever you might need, which is for example needed in, in finance. So instead of just looking at the price, you might want to look at some other quantities that, uh, so some correlations between, between the, the stock prices, you would, might want to, instead of just look at the, the actual value, look at some extra data. And, uh, and so this, uh, this general framework actually allows for that. Uh, so in principle, uh, the, the, for example, the degree two part of X does not have to be strictly related to the, the first part. So in, in principle, it could be anything as long as the constant term is zero. But uh, you will see that in some specific cases, we get uh, nice results. So this is sort of the most general recursion that you can get for the cumulants in the stochastic setting. Of course, if you take just X to be um, and just a single path, uh, you can recover uh, the previous results. So this is sort of really an extension of, uh, of the, the classical results on cumulants. And uh, okay, so now I'll try to speak about a little bit the, uh, about the consequences of this, uh, of this result. And I've thrown, uh, maybe let me, let me show this first. So this is sort of where we stand with, with our results. So we are here in this uh, left corner here. So this is the functional equation that we have for the semi-martingale sim signature cumulants in this tensor setting. And there are a number of ways you could go to recover a known on, and actually get new results. So for example, you could say that your martingale doesn't have jumps and you get again a functional equation for continuous semi-martingale cumulants. This is a tensor value. Again, this is new, uh, but we, we realized in the process that it is actually, you can do it with jumps immediately. You could make, uh, you could say, okay, my semi-martingale is actually a deterministic process. So a number of terms will vanish and you get a finite variation House version of the house of ODE, so where you actually allow a Magnus expansion for a driver that has jumps. Uh, this is actually might might even be new as uh, as far as I know. Uh, and you can, of course, the most obvious thing is just make everything commute. And when you make everything everything commute, you actually recover this diamond expansion. Uh, and then, okay, the the parallel edges means doing the same operations deterministic, you of course recover nothing because uh, everything reduces just to an exponential type ODE. So uh, S prime equals uh, X S, XS, everything's commutative, everything's deterministic. So you exactly know how to solve this. So it doesn't give you any new information. And of course, if you make it continuous, then again, it's trivial, but you can also make it, so take the semi multigale to be continuous first and then make it deterministic and you recover a finite variation version of the Hausdorff formula. And then if you again make everything commutative, you end up in the same place. So this diagram also commutes because mm -hmm. all, all the operations, yes. Sorry, no, I didn't want to interrupt you, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Can you in this picture also think about numerical methods for SDEs uh, with jumps, et cetera? Would this, uh, would this make sense? I mean, in principle, yes, just because uh, of this local description that um, the signature provides you 
uh, for, for solutions of such equations, as I showed in one of the slides, right? So if you have the signature, you can actually give a local description of the solution of any ODE that's driven by your, uh, by your path. So here we have come up with a signature that actually includes uh, jump terms. So in principle, you could, uh, you could analyze such equations. At, at least I always, so I always thought that this, the nature of this Marcus integral is somewhat tricky or not so straightforward uh, as a stochastic uh, integral. Is this yeah, true? Yeah, I'm not saying it's easy, but in principle you could do it. I mean, we have not done it, but, okay. uh, but yes, uh, I mean, at least the tools are there. Thank you. Okay, so one thing that I skipped, oops, was this recursion. So if you, if you take the, the result here, uh, this is an equality between tensor series, right? And then if you project to the levels, you can actually get uh, a recursion for this cumulant. So you see here, for example, one thing that's different from the, uh, from the classical setting is that you get contributions at all levels from coming from the original semi martingale So if you allow for a, just a real valued one, this part would not be here, you get a diamond product, and then you get a bunch of terms that are coming either from the jump term or from the non-commutativity. So for example, the gamma, the, sorry, omega i term uh, is the usual Magnus type recursion that you would get. Uh, the Q uh, I term, which stands for quadratic variation, it's what you would get by actually picking out the degree N. So N is dictated by the, the level I'm looking at, the cumulant I'm looking at here. Uh, you just go and, and try to pick out exactly the, the tensor term of this degree and the same for the other terms. So you get a number of contributions either coming from the non-commutative part, from the stochastic part, or from the jump part. And depending on where, uh, how you choose your martingale, you can get rid of some of these terms and, and recover some other more, maybe more useful regression. So in principle, this is still very hard to compute. It's very explicit, but uh, very hard to compute. Right, so let's see what happens when you take some specific cases. So one, specific case that's very interesting also for finance is when you take uh, time homogeneous Levy processes. So in this case, your process, your process X uh, admits a very specific uh, decomposition and a variation part and a jump part, which can be described in terms of these characteristics. So the drift, uh, 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 quadratic variation part, and some, some jump measures, one with con that's concentrated on small jumps, one that's concentrated on big jumps. And here, uh, the integrability conditions that I spoke about uh, can, be, can be made very precise. So these are just moment conditions on the jumps. So you, you want to kind of your jumps not to be too big, uh, also not to concentrate too much. And uh, if you are in this setting, and you apply the, the, the result that we got, we actually obtain a tensor value generalization of uh, some old result, well, not, not too old, but some previous result by Fritz and Shekhar, which gives you um, a recursion for the martingale cumulants, and it's very explicit, and actually it's sort of a, a generalized levy hinging formula. Yeah, so these are, if you know about Levy processes, it's, this would look uh, familiar to you. Uh, right, so another even more special case, just set the uh, drift to zero, the jump parts to zero, and you ha have only a Brownian motion, which is time dependent. So the volatility here depends on time. So this is kind of uh, the, the finance parlance. And in this case, which is again, very interesting for, for financial applications, you can recover again, a very simple recursion for the cumulants, which is nice. And in the very special case, when you take X to be just a Brownian motion, you recover uh, uh, for what's called now Fawcett's formula, which is what's sort of maybe one of the first uh, expected signature explicit computations. And this again may, may look very familiar to you if you're familiar with Brownian motion. This is really the, the, 
the characteristic function of a Brownian motion. So it's just di the diagonal matrix with uh, the variance on the diagonal. And uh, we can uh, recover again more results. For example, if you take the same Brownian motion as before and you stop it when you exit uh, from finite volume, then you, this defines also stochastic process and you can compute the, the logarithms by solving a, an infinite cascade of PDEs. So these again, a tensor value PDEs, which means really that uh, for each word you have a different PDE and uh, the way that this is written here would tell you that actually you get a cascade of PDEs. So if you go to level uh, N, you actually have to know all the, the, uh, the solutions of the previous PDEs, but you, in principle, you can solve this recursively. Right. Um, and uh, again, coming back full circle to the beginning, if you take this signature cumulants and you project to the symmetric algebra, so you make all the variables, everything commutes, then the signature actually reduces to just a normal exponential, a, a commutative classical exponential, where X here, very large number of commuting variables, but they, they are commuting, so it's, uh, it's fine. And in the very, very specific case where your uh, actual semi martingale only has uh, a vector part, so it's just the random variables put one next to each other in front of some symbols commuting, uh, you see that the signature cumulants that we talked about are just the classical, well, this is for the moments, but then it means that the uh, cumulants are just the mixed cumulants of, of this increment random variable. So we really are generalizing to very, uh, very, very large setting the classical, the classical results of moments and cumulants. And, the, and then of course, if you apply a recursion, a lot of the terms vanish and you recover the, the classical moment cumulant recursion that I showed you before. And of course, we can actually uh, also recover the diamond expansion, but we also generalize it to include jump terms because uh, the, the result by Fitzka uh, didn't include this part. And it was because they con consider only continuous semi martingales But if your semi martingales has jumps, then you need to include this term into the recursion. But again, it's all contained in, in our result. Uh, and maybe one last thing, if X is deterministic, my last two minutes, if X is deterministic, then uh, you actually recover a finite variation uh, version of the Hausdorff ODE, which also includes a jump, jump part and you get a, a jump, a Magnus recursion with jumps. So this is the classical Magnus uh, expansion here, the classical recursion from the Magnus expansion, but you need to add this term here, which takes uh, into account products of the increments. And, and of course, this is also, even if you don't have the jumps, this is a bit more general because it allows for a full tensor series to be included here, not only uh, a real valued path or uh, I mean, a matrix value. You, you can mix them all together in the same recursion. Uh, right, so maybe in the last 30 seconds, I still have one minute, I think. Is, is that right? Yeah, okay. So I want to make a comment slash conjecture. So we did all these nice computations, but uh, they're kind of, there's a missing structure there. And I think there is a way of, uncovering and, tell, and saying more precisely where, where all these recursions come from. So if you take two martingales, you can define these two operations here. So this is uh, the Marcus integration that I showed, uh, I briefly skipped uh, in one of the slides. Uh, and you have to be careful here because since the, these are non-commuting variables, you, you have to really keep the order of integration. But then the, uh, the chain rule would tell you that this relation is satisfied. So if you, uh, if you define this, uh, a star product by summing these two uh, operations, keeping the order of the variables, you actually end up with the usual uh, pro uh, Cauchy product. Oh, there's a time variable here, which I'm omitting here, but, uh, but that's fine. And the signature is actually a solution to a fixed point equation, a linear fixed point equation which is sort of what was written in the, in the previous slide. So this is sort of res, uh, solving a recursion in a weight zero Rotterbachster algebra. Yeah. This is sort of the, what's going on in the background. 
and you can write this as a really a kind of a time order exponential or chronological exponential. And what the Magnus expansion tells you is that you can find a unique element that, that this kind of time order exponential really becomes an exponential. Uh, but what you have to put in here is really complicated. And this was proven in this context using dendriform uh, algebras or shuffle algebras by, Manch uh, by Dominique and Kurush in 2007. And it gives uh, an explicit recursion for, for the components of this uh, guy here, which in the very specific case of integration actually reduces to the classical Magnus recursion. But if you come from stochastic analysis, you actually don't want to do integration this way, but you want to do Ito integration. And the problem with Ito integration is that, is that you get this extra term, which is given by the bracket. And again, if you extract it from your integration of your type of integration, you end up with a, with a quasi-shuffle algebra or trident form algebra. And what the, this kind of Marcus transformation was saying is that the signature is also a solution to this modified equation here. So you have to twist somehow your driving path, which for, on the left it's just a normal, it's just the x that you were given, but you have to include all these quadratic bracket terms. And this, these are the correction terms that were appearing in the definition of the Marcus signature. And, okay, this is now, uh, again, I, oh, sorry. Okay, let me, give me 10 seconds. So this is again a, a time order exponential. And what I conjecture and sort of what's proven in the, in, hidden in the slides is that you can find make it into a true exponential, and you can sort of split the action of the integration, like kind of the classical integration and the contraction, stochastic contraction. So this is also dictated by the rota factor feature. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Sorry for being over time. No worries. Thank you very much. Comments. Sorry. So let's thank <laughs> Nicolas for this nice talk. Okay, so we have time for some quick questions because we are all starving. Yes. Uh, Nicolas? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so about this last side, slide, mm. the, the, black t the white triangle is prely. Uh, yes. What about this black triangle? Is it something what? just magmatic or what? what? Uh, I would say it's partly, just because you can you can build a post list structure here. I, I was not really precise about the triangle, but I would say that this is sort of postly Magnus expansion. Okay. But because uh, when you add the symmetrizers here, you don't get a free list structure if you're in, in this setting on the right, but you get a post list structure. And then ah, okay. this, this formula here is sort of relating the two. Because this, uh, this black dot is an associative product, right? Yes, yes. Ah, okay, yeah. So this so is giving you the second bracket. Okay, so it so seems mostly. Mostly, yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, actually, Kurush and I have been working on this for a while, and uh, we think we're very close to a solution to this to make this conjecture really precise. So it should be, it should be out soon, I guess. Also, also the the paper that I presented, it's not really done, but it should be done soon as well. So I'm prom promising two papers. Uh, that's a big promise, but uh, anyway, they should be. They are almost finished. So. So this, but uh, this needs a bit more work. That's why I made it a conjecture, not a theorem. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Another quick question. Could you return to this slide with these uh, successive sub expansions that characterize this uh, generalized Magnus expansion? This one. Uh, yes. Or, or that one. So. No, no, the next one, that's, uh, yeah. it seems to be. Uh, so these expansions, are they interconnected? No, no, they're not, uh, in the sense you don't need to know one, you don't have to feed one into the other, am I right no. or? Mm, no, okay. yeah. no, you're right, yes. So it's sort of, a, because here every, everything is sort of interconnected, right? Kappa appears everywhere. And uh, yeah, it's sort of a mess. But if you're smart enough, you can actually work through the expressions and project and then get a, a expression that only depends on the previous kappa, but not, for example, C doesn't depend on the jump. Well, not explicitly. I mean, the previous level of kappa will also have some of these terms in there, but uh, yeah. 
So if you're given Kappa to some level, you can just insert it here. You don't need to actually separate the jump part and the continuous variation part in order to be able to iterate once more. That's what you mean. Yes, yeah, that's important. It's important that, uh, that one can really compute this uh, in some sense. Yes, so this sort of untangling that you see here, uh, it should be an expression of this fact here that you can untangle the kind of the quadratic variation or the variation part from, from the kind of integer. The continuous yes. integration part that you can yes. split them. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, and that's why what why these formulas look like this. At least that's my impression. Yes. 